Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by Mosaic, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free two-week trial on their website at www.streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com using the promo code MICROCAP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Plano Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And you're listening to episode 208. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes and now Spotify. That's kind of cool. Uh, it really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. Uh, special thank you to our sponsors for today's episode, Stream by Mosaic, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free two-week trial on their website at www.streamrg.com. That's www.streamrg.com using the promo code MICROCAP. And Quarter, Q-U-A-R-T-R, whose mission is to change the way people look at investor relations and create a completely new bridge between companies and stakeholders. Visit your app store of choice to try it out. And that's Quarter, Q U A R. TR. We are very excited to host our first in-person event in nearly three years. The Planet Microcap Showcase is back in Las Vegas on May 3rd through the 5th, 2022 at Bally's Hotel and Casino. It's time to see each other. It's time to network in person. Let's make it all happen in the entertainment and business capital of the world, Las Vegas. For more information, please go to www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. Now, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Artem Foken, the founder and portfolio manager at Carocan Capital LLC. He joined me last year on an episode of the Investors Roundtable to discuss microcap due diligence in the virtual world, where our focus was on how one-on-one meetings with companies has changed. Uh, it, it was only the tip of the iceberg, as we discussed why for Artem, Interviewing management is a crucial aspect to his 24-7 hunt for multi-baggers. I really enjoyed our conversation as we learned more about Artem's investing philosophy, the ideal investment, and how his investing style has changed and much more. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 208 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Artem Foken. This episode is brought to you by Stream by Mosaic. You can find them at www.streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that is starting to become an integral part to investors' research process. They have a number of interviews on a wide variety of companies, including TMT, consumers, industrials, real estate, and more. Stream provides over 300 expert interviews per week, and 70% of their experts are found exclusively on Stream. Stream was built by Mosaic, and unlike any other transcript libraries, Stream integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Stream's community of experts and thought leaders partner with Stream to build their professional brands and expand their industry influence. Right now, there are approximately 8,500 plus call transcripts available. For more information, please visit www.streamrg.com. 
Welcome back to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And I'm really excited for today's guest. Uh, it's uh, someone that uh, we had on a roundtable episode not that long ago talking about, you know, speaking with management teams and how that's integral part of his due diligence process. And he's been just a friend and homie for a while. And it's this is Again, long overdue. I'm so excited to have him here. I'd like to introduce Artem Fokin. He is the founder and portfolio manager at Caracan Capital LLC. Artem, thanks for joining me, man. How are you doing? Hi, Bobby. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me over. It's great to have you on, man. And uh, I, listen, I know quite a few folks that are listening to us probably have met you or spoken to you or heard your name before, but let's let's dive a little deeper. You know, where where did your passion for investing begin and as well as learning a little bit about your background? Sure. So I got into investing after doing my MBA at Stanford Business School. Growing up, I grew up in Russia. As, as you on the average joke, surprise, I'm not from New Jersey or Texas or Louisiana. Uh, I also was interested in the finance and law. And in, and in Russia, as, many, as well as in many other continental European countries, you, go, you choose your major at a very young age. So I was choosing which department of university to go when I was 16. So I went into law and I practiced for a few years, both mostly in, in New York. And then I went to business school. I graduated in 2011. And this is where my interest in investing began. When I go, when I was going to law school, to business school, I knew that I want to go into investing. I didn't know which asset class, which strategy, which type. That was the business school all about. And after finishing, I went to the hedge fund world. Very cool. All right. You know, one thing that's so unique about you in getting to know you over the last few years here is that you are one of the most tenacious investors and people that I know. Like you're hungry for knowledge. You want to meet as many people as possible. I mean, where did that influence come from? Was it growing up in Siberia? Was it, you know, just being that passionate about investing? Like I'd love, love to hear where that, that fire came from. Well, I don't know whether it came from Siberia or not, even though passion for warm and nice weather definitely came from there. That's why I really enjoy living in California. So, look, it probably comes from the need that you need to prove yourself at every time at the new level. So when I was growing up, I was growing up in Russian provinces. And unlike the United States, which is a very decentralized country, you can have a wonderful Korean education in Texas or California or East Coast or Chicago. You don't need to be in one city only in order to have a fulfilling career or get wonderful education. Russia is very different. It's very centralized. You got to be in Moscow. So as someone who was not growing up there, you already have a media disadvantage. So you need to get up to the next level and then you prove there. And then once I did that, I came to the U.S. And I came to the U.S. when I was 21 in 2004. And uh, nobody, U.S. is a great country. And I think it's very welcoming to new people. But at the same time, nobody going to hire you when you're 21. You're super green. Your English is not a native language. You have an accent. And you don't often understand the context around you very well. I remember when I was, it's probably like my first week as a lawyer at the law firm. And then one of the senior partners explains like, Artem, we're doing, I'm doing this speech to XYZ, big bank, prop desk, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't know what the pitch is because it's coming from baseball. I was like, pitch what? And the guy shows me baseball bat, the move. And I've never watched baseball in my life. And I'm like, what he's talking about? So I get that I need, uh, I need to help him, but what he needs, what he's talking about. So that creates that hunger for knowledge and that creates the desire to prove yourself because that's the only way for you to progress. I was just, I literally, I'm so glad you told that story because I was going to ask, like coming to the U.S. at 21, English is your second language. You know, you have a heavy accent, you know, I, I like what was that culture shock? I mean, clearly that was a great example right there, but what, yeah. what else? I mean, is it still ongoing? No, it's probably not ongoing right now. Even <laughs> though I still do not understand rules of baseball. Uh, that's for sure. I can help you out there. No problem. That, that, that sounds great. I appreciate okay. it, Bobby. And there's some funny things, right? Uh, there, there will be some expressions that I would learn in uh, business context or investing context, but only later I would actually find out what they really mean. For example, hit a home run. Yeah, okay. If you make a really great investment that goes up 5x, yeah, it's a home run. That's very clear. 
you got a multi bag, it's a hit, you, you, you just hit a home run. But only late I realized where it actually came from, from sports, as you know, many other awesome expressions have, have come from. Uh, look, I think New York is incredibly international. So there are a lot of international people around you. And uh, let's put it this way. New York is unique. I think in New York, you go to a restaurant, you sit down, you order a meal. You almost never asked, oh, where are you from? While in many other parts of the country, it would be asked because people are curious. So I think in New York, it's, it, New York, it's a very nice entry point, in my opinion, because it's a lot easier to adapt to the new environment. Very cool. All right. So as you said, you know, came here when you were 21, you started off with law and then you went to, and then what inspired you to go to business school? Were you just sick of law? Uh, no, I, I wasn't sick of law. I actually really enjoyed practicing law. I think it's like playing through them. I was an international tax lawyer. So it's the way I describe it is playing through dimensional chess. So that was actually a lot of fun. It's intellectually incredibly rewarding. And, but at the same time, it's very abstract. Because if you think about it, all those rules are just made up by Congress or similar bodies around the world and then become law, and then Treasury and IRS issue certain other rules, et cetera, et cetera, and you work with them then. They made them one way, they could have made them another way. There is a lot of randomness there. And then you play with all those pieces. So it feels very abstract. Well, if you talk to business, it's very real. They make XYZ product or XYZ service. People actually go and consume that. That's very real, their life changes. But you ask me how did the interest develop? Mostly through clients, because when I was working as an as international tax lawyer, we had a lot of clients from prop desks at big banks, investment funds, etc. And when you look across the table, you see, gee, that's actually really interesting what they do too. Like, maybe it's even more interesting than what I do. How do I learn more about that? And that's how I figured out I would go to business school. I did, my, I did my two levels of CFA before business school just to make sure that I actually will enjoy studying finance in depth. And then I went to Stanford. You're an enigma, man. Like, wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Like, you, you got two levels of CFA even before going to business school. Like, who does that? that that's that's <laughs> literally, that's, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Um, all right, so go to business school. Catch us up, you know, from from being that initial inspiration, you want to be an investor, you know, then to founding Carol Can Capital LLC, you know, what, how did we get there? Sure. So after I finished business school, I worked uh, at a hedge fund here in the Bay Area. And then, so this is my theory. Most people in hedge fund business who meet two criteria. Number one, they think that they're smart. And to be very clear, I didn't say that they're smart. I said they think they are. And number two, they have a certain healthy dose of ambition. They want to run their own portfolio. It's, so, it's the desire for self-expression. I don't know whether you're into painting or not. I'm not really. So my example can be a little bit weak, but I think it will drive the point home. If you are an artist and you create your paintings in a certain way, let's say Manet style, right? Like French Impressionism. And someone comes to you and says, Bobby, tomorrow you need to paint as Picasso. You're like, that's not my style. What are you asking me for? You're like, no, 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 Bobby, you got to do that. And they're like, okay, I'll do it. So then you paint in a different style. That hinders your self-expression. And even if you have an absolutely amazing portfolio manager as your boss, and I did, my boss was terrific, Two people will never see the world exactly through the same lenses. They need to be philosophically aligned to work well as a team and to have a good rapport between PM and analyst. That's required. But even if that rapport is there and the overall investment style and philosophy are aligned, it will never be perfectly 100% overlapping. So there will be always points of not even friction, but healthy debate. And you feel like, ah, oh, if it was my own portfolio, I would have made that position bigger. Oh, I would have that my position smaller, et cetera. So that drives self suppression. So if you combine the two, healthy dose of ambition, plus you think that you're good, you won't run your portfolio. And in most funds, the structure is single PM. So you cannot get your own portfolio regardless of your tenure or how well you're doing. So that's what led me to the desire to run my own fund. 
I'd like to take a quick second to tell you about this episode's sponsor, Quarter. With Quarter, you get frictionless access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports from markets all around the world, straight from your pocket for no cost. Quarter's mission is to change the way people look at investor relations and create a completely new bridge between companies and stakeholders. The first step on this journey is to let you, the user, interact with the company's content while you're listening. Visit your app store of choice and try it out today by searching for Quarter, and that's Q-U-A-R-T-R. Now back to the show. Very cool. I, so how long were you working at the hedge fund before you were like, all right, I'm going to, uh, okay, it's time for me to do my own thing. I left about three and a half years later. After three and a half years. Like yeah. a plus minus. I mean, was there anything that you pulled from that experience when you were considering the construction of Caracat? Look, so the one of the premises of the, of the investment philosophy of the team where I used to work was it's a wonderful thing to buy from people who want to sell you regardless of price. This is similar to for selling, non-discriminate selling, very similar philosophically to You Can Be Stock Market Genius by Joel Grimblet, which is a fascinating book. Yeah, yeah I'm sure you have it on your bookshelf. It's just, probably just, still just my favorite it. book. Yeah, just, just checking check that nobody yeah. stole it. <laughs> so yeah, it's probably still among my favorite books. And uh, that was one of the things that I probably brought to the founding of Karakan. And similarly, another thing, again, it sounds very obvious, but that's important, is the idea of investing in the less efficient markets. The high efficiency of the market, more difficult for you to make high returns. But, you know, not everybody, everybody believes that. But where do you look for that efficiency and how you do that may differ from one fund to another. Very good. All right. So let's dig into Karakin Capital LLC sure. a little bit, and it, because it's very reflective of your own investing philosophy because you're the founder and portfolio manager. So um, as you as you stayed in your investor deck, Carol Can Capital aims to generate highly attractive returns by investing predominantly in the small cap space by conducting in-depth award-winning winning research. So my two questions here is one, you know, let's dive deeper into what the general investing philosophy is for you and Carol Can. And then also why why small cap? Why small cap and below? You know, sure. what, what, how did you get there? Okay, sure. So let's start with the fundamental premise. Fundamental premise is this. I want my key metric as a portfolio manager, which I want to optimize and maximize, is the portfolio return per unit of time spent. And that unit can be a day, can be a week, can be a month, whatever you choose. So what it means? Time is fixed. The only, the only thing which will be an output is the return potential. It leads me to the premise that I want to be spending time on investment ideas where I can make 3x, 4x, 5x, or even more of the invested capital. I don't want to be investing in investment ideas. I don't want to be spending time on investment ideas where I can sp- where my return potential 50%, 50. That's not that interesting. And most of those ideas will play out, in my experience, this way. You think it's 50% upside potential in two years. It will end up being 35 in three. And your IRR is not particularly compelling. And if you're wrong, you still probably have 20 25% downside. So that leads me to looking the search for multi buggers. The next question becomes, okay, how do you find them? Or rather, which parts of the market you are more likely to find them? Because I'm not the only one in the market, sadly. It means that you need to go, I want to go to places in the market which are less efficient, competition is less intense, and that leads me naturally to micro cap and small cap. It doesn't have to be a small cap or micro cap. I'm happy to invest something bigger if I see the obvious discrepancy in pricing, but it's just easier to find those opportunities in micro cap and small cap. Very good. All right. So this, this leads me then to, you know, this one part in your, in your investor deck that I just, I mean, I'm probably going to name the episode based on this and, and it has to do with the ideal investment. Mm. So can you describe to me what is the ideal investment for you? Sure. 
So let's talk about the ideal investment. And not every investment fits that way, but it's really what I'm looking for. So think about a company that today, and I will pick up pretty random numbers that are just easy to calculate. Think about a company that today generates $100 million of revenue and it has 3% EBITDA margin. For sake, for sake of simplicity, let's assume that CapEx is non-existent. There is, a, there is no debt. There is no excess cash. So just to keep things simple. And there are no substantial working capital changes at all. So today, that business, you look at it, and it's pretty mediocre. 100 million revenue, 3% EBITDA margin. It's difficult to get excited. And let's say it trades at 10 times EBITDA. 30 million market cap, slash enterprise value in my example. Not exciting. But if after doing all the research, you be, I believe that that business in the next two, three, four years can grow from 100 million of revenue to 300 million of revenue, and the EBITDA will go from 3 million to 30, 40, 50. That makes it exciting. Because in this case, I can be buying into a business that three years out is trading at one, two, three times EBITDA. Well, the fair multiple should be a lot higher. The real challenge there is to identify those companies because there is no screen that will spit you a list. Artem, go research this, and then you will find something like that. Got it. So how did you, how did you get to that? You know, was there... What, what, I mean, obviously this was years of work, years of being in the markets, but like, what was it that got you to thinking like, all right, for me, this is the ideal investment opportunity. There are two elements there. One is business element. And another one is uh, more of investing search idea generation element. Let's start with the business. What is a business? Like simplistically, I know there are many definitions, high quality, et cetera, et cetera, higher IC, but I will simplify it a little bit in terms of financial metrics that will be showing up. A great business to invest in will be something that is growing rapidly and expanding, expanding margins. Like that's the best. And how margins expand? Well, because of operating leverage and that operating leverage can, can be coming in at the level of cost of revenue. Many software businesses, when they're relatively small, can be generating 60% gross profit margin. Once they get to, once they scale up, they can be 80% or even higher. That's one element of margin expansion. Another element is the operating leverage at the SGNA level. If you combine the two, and you saw in my example, the EBITDA margin in my hypothetical example went from very mediocre 3% to anywhere between 10 and 20. How did that happen? It shouldn't be that ha happening that way but occasionally does because of operating leverage. And uh, so that's the business element. And then there is investment element. What is not obvious in the financials when you just look at them? What is not obvious is the operating leverage because margins today are pretty obvious. You can screen for that. You can just pull out 10K or 10Q and divide two numbers in your head and it's pretty easy. You can do whatever you want. But operating leverage is the list of it's, it's pr the true impact of operating leverage is one of the most non obvious things when you invest. If you can spot those early on, coupled with high revenue growth potential, that creates that massive growth in EBITDA slash profit slash free cash flow. Revenue can grow up only three or four times, but EBITDA can grow up 10 times or more. It just it's something that more difficult for people to analyze. That's why I want to focus there. So let's let's actually dig into that a little bit. You know, how how do you think about operating leverage when you know you said you know anybody can go through look at the financials, do the quick math, look at the operating margin, all that kind of stuff. But the non obvious things on on the balance sheet. I mean, this is clearly from your experience being a tax attorney all these years, I'm sure, you know, being able to pull on that a little bit. What, what does that mean to you? What is not obvious there that if you look a little closer, stands out to you? Look, it boils down to two components. Number one is unit economics. Number two. Say that one more time. Yes. Number one is unit economics. Okay. Number two is your overall SGNA base. So let's start with unit economics. If, if a company on its product or service makes lots of money on, every, on, any, on any 
single transaction or any single client or customer or customer interaction, and I'm giving you the broad range of those types because different businesses are different. If they make a lot of money on every single one of them, it's the question, but the company as a whole is making very little money. 3% EBITDA margin in my example. That means that it's not a problem with the product or service or customer value proposition. It's the problem that the company is subscale. They need more time to grow and they need to be able to execute. If they do that, they will grow into those higher margins. So that's the unit economics and unit economics also sadly do not show up on income, in income statement or balance sheet. So you need to figure out how much customers are paying and how much does it cost for the company to produce that product or create that service. So how often do you place that bet where maybe they're, you know, they're at that subscale point? Mm-hmm. Have you, have you, do you often make bets when they're still at that subscale, but you saw something in terms of maybe tailwind or something like that, that you're like, all right, I'm going to place my bet now because I think they're going to be able to hit that scale. And then of course, increase their operating margins and all that good, all the good stuff that eventually does happen when you pick right. You know, how often do you look at those? And then with, for that subsect of companies, what do you look for there? Like what, what, what's a screaming, wow, this is a great investment opportunity, even though they're at this point in their life cycle. Okay. So how often it's one of my favorite investment patterns. So it's pretty often, right? Now, are all my investments like that? No, not necessarily, but it's one of my favorite things. So that's number one. Number two, it's very industry dependent. And in some industries, it's easier to scale and financial patterns will be more, they are more analyzable and predictable than in others. So let's pick software. Most software businesses, if they're good, should be running at 80% gross profit margin. If they're lousy or have a mechanical torque issue, then it's probably will be 60 or 65 or 70, less attractive. So you need to figure out how good is software product. You need, I need to understand whether there is a very heavy human touch or not. That goes back to the quality of the code. And then you need to understand what the incremental margins so far. Because incremental margins, you can look at historicals, the difference between your gross profit margin increase and your revenue increase. And if you see that the company as a whole has 65 gross profit margin, but incrementals are running at 85 or 88, yeah, they would get to 78, 80% margin. It's the question of time. That's on the easier side. On the more complicated side would be consumer, especially if it's a one-time purchase or there is no contractual commitment because then it goes into your lifetime value of a customer versus your customer acquisition costs and what's the repeat rate. And those not often disclosed, sometimes they're more difficult to analyze. So that's a little bit tougher. Because if you think about unit economics and the highest level of abstraction, it's literally, what's your customer worth during the lifetime? Can, how can you, what can you do to increase that lifetime value? Similarly, or in re- reversely, what can you do to mess it up? So don't do that. If you see business doing something like that, run away. And how customer acquisition cost will be changing. And then it gets us to like next level of discussion here. Okay, if you see cost LTV to CAC is very attractive today, what will happen with CAC going forward? In some businesses, as business scales, CAC actually goes down. In some businesses, CAC actually goes up. Because everybody, not everybody, most customers who wanted the product already have it. And then you spend more money on marketing. And typically in those situations, people who benefit from this is people, is companies uh, who are in the advertising business. Google, Facebook, and all similar things. It's more heavy in consumer than in B2B businesses. So then, so you need to figure out which, how CAC will likely behave and you know, model that accordingly so that you're not taken by surprise later. Absolutely. All right. So let's dig into some of your, your research process. And, and let's start off with idea generation. How do you find new ideas? Listen, I know just, you know, I host events. I know you do a thousand meetings at every one of our events and you, you want it that way. 
you know, um, so love to hear your general idea of how, how you find new ideas and, and then, you know, we'll go from there. Sure. So, yes, as you alluded to, Bobby, um, your conferences play an important role in the idea generation process. So I meet hundreds of companies a year. And those are when I started. That's a low number. <laughs> that is a well, low number for sure. <laughs> when I started, I believe that I need to be super well prepared for every meeting that I would do. Obviously, that's a good way. It's a good way to do things. But the downside is that it limits how many meetings you can do and how many companies you can meet. And as my pattern recognition evolved and improved, I realized that that's a bad way to allocate time. And that goes back to what, where we started with why do I focus on multi-baggers? I want to maximize return per, per, per unit of time. Same here. And now I feel comfortable to meet companies when I know very little about them. And I'm very upfront and very honest with management teams and say, I run a hedge fund management firm. I never met you. I don't know much about your business, but I would love to learn. And then I spend 30 minutes with the management team, sometimes 25, sometimes 30, sometimes an hour, with the goal to understand whether this company and investment opportunity makes me interested to go do work and then reconnect with management again, talk to customers, figure out what the business is about, what do they do, what's the customer value proposition. So that allows me to do hundreds and hundreds of meetings. And most of them result in nothing. But some of them lead to a very promising investment idea. I, you know, when you're doing your, your meetings, you know, a lot of folks uh, that I interview on here, you know, and, and all the famous investors that you see in the books behind us, you know, they're very much like, all right, if I don't understand it in the first 10 seconds, like I'm, I'm out for the most part. I mean, do you feel the same way when, when you're doing some of these meetings or are you, are you like, nah, I want to give it the benefit of the doubt because I, I just, you know, especially with some of the companies that you meet at our events, like this micro nano cap companies. I mean, they're not, not, not every company is going to be a simple business and that's okay. You know, um, so lo love to hear your thoughts there. Like, do you turn off or are you like, all right, okay, this seems like it's going to be a complicated one. Like, let, let me get, let me get another shot of espresso and, and dig in. So I actually don't, I actually quit coffee a few years ago. So, uh, but, but, but I do make an exception when I'm in Greece or in Turkey for the local coffee. In Turkish, in Turkey, they call it Turkish coffee. In Greece, they call it Greek coffee. So I don't know who is right, but I enjoy both. So, but in, while I'm in the US, I do not drink coffee. So I would rather get tea or something else. But your point is well taken. So I definitely don't want to make a judgment in the next, in the first 10 seconds or first minute. There are a couple of things here. So first of all, some management teams can be excellent at what they do, but your conference or some other conferences or me reaching out to them and saying, hi, dear John, my name is Artem, I run Karakan Capital LLC. I'd like to meet you. Sometimes I do those, you know, reach outs myself. And they may not have a lot of experience as a public company CEO yet. They will learn, they will grow, but right now they may be not experienced in that. And nobody should expect it from them because their main job is to run the business. So I want, I'm okay with something that is not very clearly communicated in the first 10 minutes, but by the next, by the end of 30 minutes, if I cannot figure out, that's probably a pass. And uh, look, it also depends on the type of questions. For example, if CEO is not fluent on some technical finance questions, I get it, that's okay, that's why there is a CFO. Sure, I would prefer that CEO also owns every single number and knows what, how GAP financials work, or if I ask if it's a Canadian or European company, but it's probably unrealistic to expect. If, if CEO cannot articulate why the business exists and why customers need and hopefully like and even more hopefully love the product or service, then it's a bigger problem. Because if CEO is not customer and client focused, most likely the rest of the organization will not be client focused either. And if you're not client focused, eventually 
you will not succeed as a business. It's ultimately the customer who determines the fate of any business enterprise. Interesting. So, I, all right, let, let's get into a little story time. Love to hear some anecdotes of, of some of this, this process. When you've done your meetings, some of the questions you've asked, like, I'm sure everybody is like, all right, we all know Artem does like a thousand meetings. Like he must have a few, you know, funny, interesting, maybe even stories of companies that you're like, mm, I don't know about this one going in. And it totally flipped you once you, once you, um, once you actually got into the meeting. So, you know, what have been some of the most interesting ones or, and, and then we'll get into like some of the tips and tricks that you can give some folks out here that may not have as much experience. I know I just threw like 10 questions at you. Yeah, it's all like 15 questions. What was <laughs> called? That's a compiled question council. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so, so he, here's an interesting uh, story. Uh, I will not name the company for obvious reasons, but I met with the company once, probably like 30 minutes uh, or conversation. It was, it was before pandemic. So it means it was on phone, not on Zoom. And uh, it takes me a while to understand the business model and the customer value prop. 30 minutes go by, like, okay, terrific. I'm still kind of confused. So I sit down, start reading, start putting pieces together. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I, and, and, and this company, it, it's imp- the insurance reimbursements are very important for this company. And I'm like, what they're doing seems to be incredibly strange and I'm not even sure whether it's allowed. To be clear, I'm not an insurance lawyer. I got no clue how insurance works or rather I would say insurance is a completely complex matter in the United States of America. But what I'm seeing, it's really strange and weird. So I asked for a follow-up, for a, for a follow-up call, call with the CEO and within the first minute, I tell the gentleman, listen, now you need to explain to me how what you do is even allowed and not breaking any insurance laws? Because I don't get it. And uh, it was also partially a test because I thought either he will get very defensive or start yelling and screaming at me or hang up the phone or something. And instead, he was like, no, what we do is absolutely allowed. I will walk you through. And then he engages with me and walks me through and explains many different things in great level of detail with good level of explanation. That's attitude that you want to see from management teams. If they, if they are not shy, ideally you don't want to be, you don't want someone who is shy of a challenge. Or if, if they ask a tough question, you want them to give you a straightforward answer. To the contrary, some management teams, they will be either offended or upset or disappointed if you ask them a question and they feel that they don't have a good answer and then they were upset. That's not ideal. I'd love to hear an example of a company where like, or of a management call where, you know, maybe you went in and um, let's say you were, you, you'd heard things, you were somewhat skeptical. All right, let's give it a shot. And you were totally like flipped. And then maybe even the vice versa of like, all right, I expect this to be great. I'm, I've done my, I've done a little work on this one actually, and I think this is going to be a good call. And it ended up being a complete disappointment. You don't need to name the companies, but I, I love to hear. Come on, man, give some story. Come on, yeah, Whoa, but, I love this stuff. When I go and meet companies, right, especially for the first time, yeah. when you come with very fresh perspective and very open mind, right. Most often, I know very little about them. Sure. And by the way, that helps to not to have any preconceptions. And similarly, one of my least favorite activities, and it now happened to your conference. So everybody who is listening to your podcast, Bobby has a great conference. You should attend it. At some other conferences, occasionally, it's not one-to-one meeting. It's two people and one company. And uh, by now, I actually tell all pretty much everybody that, listen, if you cannot get me one-on-one, I'm not meeting with the company. It's just not worth it because two investors almost will never see the world the same way. One of my observations is that sometimes people come where they are prepared, but you can be either not prepared, meaning you just come and say, I want to learn, tell me, I'll have some questions. Or they, you need to be super prepared. 
or if you're in between. If you're in between, I think it's the worst. Because you know something, but you don't know the reasons why it's happening. I'll give you a specific example. A good, someone sees, my question would be, okay, tell me about your margin profile. That's a very open-ended question. Management can take this any way they want, right? That's great. And for example, an interesting answer will be, our gross profit margin running at, I'm making these numbers up, 35% right now. We have communicated publicly that our guidance for the next several years to get it from 35 to 50, and the way we're going to achieve it, X, Y, Z. That's a terrific answer, right? Now, someone who super prepared, they would already know that because they've reviewed that guidance. They know the margin profile, so they can be going one or two levels deeper. Tell me more about what are the drivers of that margin expansion. Is it efficiencies? Is it maybe you change production capacity? Maybe you outsource certain service you know, to a low-cost country? Maybe the reverse. You had a bunch of outside contractors. Now you brought them in-house. There may be different ways. That's a, that's a better question than my question. But I will get to that question in my meeting number two. What some people who are a little bit prepared, they will say, your margins are only 10%. It's really bad. What can you do? That shuts down the management. Right. They feel defensive and they're like, yeah, it's 10% or 35, whatever, right? I'm jumping from one example to the next. It's a, it's, it's a, not an open-ended question. It's very limiting. And it makes management feel potentially bad about their business. And you sound like a douchebag. Eh, that's also a disadvantage. <laughs> that's, all right. Anybody listening, that is probably one of the best tips that you could possibly have when talking to management. Because it's, such, especially in micro and nano caps, they're so accessible. You want to have an open line of conversation with them. And you don't, you do, like, even if you think it's a, a piece of crap business, or even if you think that management team mm, isn't that great, everyone deserves at least the benefit of the doubt or your respect. Um, and, and, and if you plan on not being respectful going in, like, just don't take the meeting. Like, there's no, like, why, why do that? I mean, it's different if you're already invested and you're a disgruntled investor, then that, that, that's a whole nother ball game. But if you're not, if you, if you're not a shareholder yet and you're going to go in with that attitude, like you're you just, you might as well just like listen to the presentations and call it a day. Right. Like, and, and I will add something else here. Those people who run those businesses, they, in my opinion, they do a lot more difficult and complex things than most investors. What we do is complex and difficult, but it's a non, in another way. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I never built a product or I never shipped a product. I never released a software. I never got hundreds of cu- or thousands of customers. So what they do, it's not easy. So try to understand their world and how they're doing that. Agreed. Agreed. What's, so what, I'd, love, I'd love for you to walk me through maybe if you want to have a real life, I don't know if you want to go through like one or a couple real life examples of where, you know, because clearly your number one way of idea generation is doing meetings. Very similar with Chris Krupp when we had him on here, Brian, Brian Weber as well, when we did the whole round table, yep. you know, so take us through that process. You know, what are, when you're meeting with management, what are the couple things that are like, all right, I've learned enough where like, I'm definitely ready for that second call. And then take us through from the second call onwards. We're like, okay, now I'm ready to make the, that initial investment. Yeah. Okay. So the main questions for the first conversation are, what's the customer value proposition? Why your customers using your product? That's number one. Number two, understand unit economics, how much money you make on, a, on any single transaction. Competition financial profile at a very high level. And remember, sometimes companies, this is our financial profile, we already stated 25 times, this is our goals. Sometimes they don't, they will not disclose that. Sometimes you will, okay, I know where it's today. I don't know what it will be in the future. So, but those are the basic questions. And some other, like some other minutiae would be, 
to understand the capital structure, understand them inside their ownership, et cetera. Sometimes you can just look it up. Sometimes it's easier to ask. So that's the first one. After that, if you go, go away, ideally, the dream case scenario, you finish that meeting and you type in your notes like, oh my God, it's amazing. And what I do for every single conference, I use one note. So I haven't moved to Notion yet, even though I have two friends who are telling me more. So I'm using one note from Microsoft. And for every single conference, I have separate folder or subfolder rather. And then I type my notes in one page, new company. And after I am done with the day, I will rank those meetings from one to 10. 10 meaning drop everything. This is an amazing idea. You need to research it right now. One meaning, how did you even sign up for this meeting? Or one would be this, how did Bobby even invite this company? Oh, so or any, or anybody else. But once really happened, once really happened. So, and it's sometimes it will be more like five, six, seven, eight, right? But nine and 10 are very high and not that common. So then I will be, I will start doing work on those 10. And to me, the old tens and nines. And then the most important thing for me to understand first into diligence is that management is not delusional about their product. If you go to a restaurant and you talk to a restaurant owner, they will probably never tell you, yeah, our risotto is really bad. We got no clue how people eat it. No idea. They probably will say we have great food and people love it and they come back all the time. So you want to diligence whether the product is actually indeed good, bad, or amazing, and whether it serves customer purpose. So in that context, talking to customers is the best way to go. That's the best. And generally, you ask customers, why did you choose this product? What was the selection process? And if they tell you like, oh yeah, there are 55 different products and we did RFP and uh, they came the cheapest. That's not really the good answer. Meaning it's a great answer. It's very valuable, but it's not good for the company unless they very upfront with you and say, listen, we compete on volume. We want to be the scale game in town. Our job is to offer the cheapest price. Yeah, that's a different strategy. So similarly, you ask the customers, how long did that onboarding take if it's a B2B business? Was it painful? On the scale of one to 10, how would you rank it? What would make you leave the company as a client? If the company disappears tomorrow, where would you go? Right? I remember back in 2016, I invested in a company called Commerce Hub. At this, at this point, it's a private company. It was sadly, it was uh, acquired by a couple of good private equity firms. Um, and sadly, because I was hoping that it would be like a multi-bagger, it ended up not being a multi It was a good, great, profitable investment, but I would rather still own it. And uh, I remember during, during my diligence, one of the customers explained how much time the software product saves for her and her team. And I said, okay, imagine that the product disappears. It just doesn't exist. She's like, yeah, I'll need to hire. I don't remember the number by now, but I think she said something along the lines. I will need to hire like five, six more people, which would be double, not double, increased by 50% her team count. I was like, that's pretty good. And you can kind of guess how much those people will cost and compare to what you think the cost of software is. And like, yeah, that's a great value proposition. So that's where I want to focus on. That's the customer. Then I want to focus on, and, if, and this is also where you will get confirmation or disconfirmation of com competitive dynamic. If company says, we have no competition, nobody, we're awesome. And customers give you a list of five companies who have very similar product, then either management is delusional they, or they're not telling you the entire truth or alternatively, there's always a possibility that even the customer does not understand something deep enough about the company strategy. But you want to figure out which one of those three opportunities, what, which one of three scenarios is playing right now in front of us. Then I want to look at the financial metrics myself. So if the management is telling you, we've been growing 30% for the last five years, you're like, that's great. That's really exciting. That's good. And then you go pull out financials, start putting them together in Excel, and you see that they've been growing at 10. 
you say, wait a second, maybe I misheard them. Or maybe they misled me a little bit. Now, sometimes there may be an explanation. For example, maybe they sold the business or they shut down the business. And that's why they reported financials look at 10% growth. But if you look at segment disclosure, it will be 30%. So you need to check those things because they do happen. And similar for margins. If the business, if company is saying we have 55% gross profit margin, you check the financials and the 25, something is missing. So you need to figure out why. If I pass through those things, then I will say, okay, now I want to have a second meeting with management. And I want to understand their strategy and vision, their team, their culture, how they motivate people, how they think about their goals, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be the second meeting, typically. And to be clear, often it doesn't stop at meeting number two. Often it will be like three and four, depending on the situation and how many questions you uncover. And similarly, once I make an investment, and sometimes I can make an investment after a few weeks, and sometimes it can be months of following. There is one company that I've been following loosely, fairly loosely, for probably four or five years before I made an investment. And that was a very successful one. It went up at some point in X. But I really you know, didn't do anything for a long time. Just on that, on that example but right there, I mean, why did, it, why did you take four or five years of following it before you, you went after it or made that initial investment? The company, oh, it was a spin-off. Okay. And I love spin-offs. Join the, what is your book? What is your book? Get the book out from the bookshelf. So it's okay. You, you, can, you can do it later. So I like spin-offs. It was a spin-off. Uh, it was an interesting situation. The company had a massive, like 30 million plus, I believe, this from memory, of installed users. And the question was, okay, now with a spin-off, the entrepreneurial spirits will be unleashed. And the management team will go and really execute. And they'll figure out how to monetize this massive user base. And they will be very profitable. And it didn't happen for a long time. Eventually, the management team was displaced. Someone who I think was very, very capable came in. And they articulated very clearly our job. And the company has been burning cash for all those years, as far as I remember. So I kind of followed it because it's still interesting, but they know I don't I'm not seeing any signs of execution. And the new management team is saying our laser focus is to cut costs. That's number one. We need to stop the bleeding. And then we'll be figuring out the new monetization strategy. And it seemed to me that new team is a lot more motivated than the old one. Plus, over the last probably a year, maybe and a half before I invested, the company added some new products that number one, I thought subjectively were interesting. Number two, it also shows that the company starts doing something. You're like, okay, you had a new product, you're experimenting, you're running tests, you're trying to see what... Because in this type of business, you need to try many, many things and see what works and what sticks. And if you can run those tests in a cost-efficient manner, you can run you know, dozens of tests, if not hundreds, and see what works. And then you optimize once you find what something works. So I started seeing those things. Shares were probably at around 52, oh, sorry, all-time lows. So I thought, okay, at this point, that's probably interesting. It's still a current position. Got it. So I, I want to ask you this, you know, in when you've when you optimize your research process, and let's all be fair here, you know, it's all always still learning. There's always ways yeah. to optimize it better and better. But you know, you've gotten to a point now where you, you got it, you got it pretty well in tune. But what what was there ever a time where you thought you had your process just mm, it's working solid here we go and you just got completely burned on uh, because you you missed something within the process and you had to optimize that look i don't think any of such failures were caused by the research process per se they were probably caused by a poor execution of the process or making a specific mistake and sometimes, sometimes when you look back and when I look back, I realize that those mistakes were preventable, meaning I should not have made that. I could have done something else. And sometimes you look and you say, I didn't know how to prevent it from happening at the time. Now I know. That's good. You've learned. You improve the process. But sometimes there are mistakes where you feel, gee, I would have done everything the same way because there is randomness. There is skill. 
but there is also an element of randomness. And sometimes randomness works in your favor. Sometimes it works not in your favor. It happens both ways. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you're right. Like you can do everything right. You could have a good quality belief in that management team. Heck, they could even have an incredible culture where everybody loves to work there. All the mar- everything checks every single box. Where some weird happens or, you know, that tailwind becomes a headwind or just they don't execute. There's literally nothing you can do. And you just have to be able to recognize that quickly and cut bait as soon as possible. Yep. Very true. Yeah. So, you know, since since starting Carol Ken Capital, I mean, how, how would you say your investing style has changed? Since starting out, has it changed? Does it adjust with current market dynamics, market structures? Love to hear some some more on that. Well, I think there are probably a few important changes. So some of them will be more on the research process. Some will be more on portfolio construction. So on the research process side, I become a lot more customer focused. That's number one. Number two, what you and I spend a lot of time talking about, I got better at understanding and analyzing operating leverage. That's number two. I also got better at uh, linking operating drivers of performance to financial drivers because that's ideally you want to be able to model the company based on those elementary atomic drivers and then convert them into financial performance. So I think I've got better at that. Um, like it's not enough to say, I think revenue will be growing 30%. The question is, what will drive that growth? Number of customers, pricing, product mix, upsell, cross-sell, like how do you get there? So that's the, that's the important part and you need to have a view. So um, that's some of the research changes. On the portfolio side, I've become less concentrated compared to, what, to when I just started Karakan. And uh, I'm also okay to take a relatively small positions, 1%, 2%, 3%, if I believe that they may have a disproportionate impact on the portfolio. Got it. Okay. My last question on, you know, investing philosophy strategy, how do you manage risk? You know, when you're, you're digging into small micro nano cap space for potential ideas, how do you think about risk? How do you manage it? Love, love to hear your thoughts there. Okay. So number one, there there are some risk management tools which are more of portfolio a portfolio level, and there are some things that are more you know company specific. So let's start with the portfolio. Normally, and this is all my own guidelines which I established for myself, which also means I can depart from them if I see that is appropriate. Generally, I do not like making positions bigger than seven or eight percent at cost. Why? Because I don't want to have a position which is 12, 14, 15%, and I happen to be wrong, and it goes down 50%. That's a big hole to dig yourself out. That's number one. And if you limit to seven or eight, it's a lot easier. And obviously, in order for a company, in order for a position to be seven or eight percent at cost, it means that I really believe that the downside is manageable an upside is sufficiently high. However, I can be wrong. Even with all that research, I can make a mistake. So that's why 708 helps. Now, if I find an idea where I think there is a really high octane upside potential, but the downside risk can easily be 40, 50%, it can never be a big position. But as I mentioned, it can be one, two, 3% position. Now, some people may ask, why even bother with 2% position? Isn't it a waste of your time? And my answer is no, because if that position can go up five times in two years, that will have a meaningful impact on the portfolio and it will justify the cost of me spending time, energy, and effort. And that goes back to early on conversation. Why do I focus on those multi bag opportunities and why I'm not interested in 50% upside situations? So that links into that. That's number two. Then there is number three, and I think it's more relevant. I'm not sure whether you articulate that question that way, but I feel that that way you may be going. Sometimes people, sometimes you'll hear opinions that, listen, if you invest in micro cap and small cap, how do you know that it's real? How do you know that this is that and this is that? 
So, and my best answer is that, listen, talk to customers. If you find enough customers and they love the product, then the company got to be real because there are enough people using the product. If you, okay, I will tell you a story. Found the company. Uh, it was positioned as Spotify of emerging markets. I'm like, okay, you know, Spotify, great business model of emerging markets. You know, I know something about emerging markets, right? So I start, I look at the back. That looks very compelling, like wonderful. I'm like, okay, that's terrific. Uh, and they also say that, guess what? They got a bunch of customers in Russia. Russia is one of their big markets. I was like, terrific. I go on Facebook. And, but the funny thing is that I've never heard of them. To be clear, I've been living in the US for 17 years. So I use Apple Music. I don't use many services that residents of Russia will use. So I might not know. What I do, I go on my Facebook and write a post in Russian so that my English friend, American friends will not be commenting because they don't use that product and ask, friends, which uh, streaming service for music do you use? And probably 18, 20 people respond in comments. None of them mention this company. I'm like, that means one of two things. Either somehow my friends use very different products and they're just not the target audience of this company. Or maybe there's something sketchy going on. I never dug deep enough, so I just passed. Few months later, another investor announced a short report on this company claiming that pretty much all revenue and uh, customers are not real, the company got, ended up being delisted, right? So again, I am not doing short selling, especially like that type of short selling. So I just, you know what, pass. But, uh, and I know people who went on the stock. I found them later. And I, was, and I was told them, listen, it can be real, I don't know, but, None of the friends I know in Russia use this product. It's strange. So if you're alone, at least figure out. Don't just rely on um, on uh, Herbally. on the disclosures, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Er, er, so er, that's an example where again talking to customers would help you in many of those things. Because normally, companies with great products, they're good companies. All right. Well, I think that that wraps our full conversation on uh, your investing strategy philosophy. There's so much more we could get into, but I don't know if we have a, a you know uh, many more hours here to, to go through. But I want to ask you my favorite question uh, that I ask everybody on here. You know, what what would you say is an investing experience that you know changed your career, impacted you the most, um, just really was like it just sticks with you? There were probably several, right? And I think most important ones will be that Commerce Hub investment, which is not a current position because it's a private company by now. I think it helped me appreciate uh, software businesses a lot better than I used to. That was probably second half 2016. Um, another company and another experience that was very impactful was uh, a microcap company that I invested in 20, I started investing in 2016, late 2016. Um, that was a B2B software provider in the iGaming space. And uh, that has, that's kind of a quintessential microcap investment in many ways. You invest when the market cap, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 million. And uh, the company really trying to prove itself. The product is there, but they need to get more market traction and things take longer to execute because the market moves slow, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, nobody cares about the company, among investors, I mean, for a long time. And then all of a sudden, within a very short period of time, everybody cares. And from the purchase price kind of to the highs, it goes up 11x in four years. So that's, uh, that impacts you. Then you say, yes, there is a way 
how you can invest in a very good way in microcaps. And that's how they, that are success ingredients. And another probably a good example is a company called Expel. Many people made money there. And Expel is a current position of, so either I or affiliated entities are long Expel. So this is not investment recommendation or advice. And uh, that also helps you appreciate the power of a long growth runway and the power of incredible execution by the management team. So it's kind of all different lessons, but they all had a formative experience. And also on, the, on this note, I also had some experiences where I lost the money, right? That's the nature of investment, of the investing. And uh, those are also powerful. But if you look at the impact, those winning investments are actually a lot more impactful because losing investments teach you how to avoid losers. That's important. Don't get me wrong. That's very, very important. And I learned. However, when you have winning investments and you can decode why they worked, that gives you that playbook, that footprint, a blueprint, how you can find those multi beggars. And that's a lot more impactful in your career. Oh, that's that's just money right there. All right. So to close this out here today, what, what advice would you have for either new investors, folks that you know are hardcore, you know, planet microcap listeners that maybe they haven't heard before, or that's just had that that you'd love to share with them to help them along their investing journey? Um that's a good question. So let me think about something that would be insightful and thoughtful and helpful for people. Uh, broad picture. I think barriers to learning in the investing world today are massively lower than they used to be even 10 years ago when I was finishing Stanford, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. If you go back, the way you learn investing, you go, for, you go work for an investment firm, hedge fund, loan only, whatever. And you learn kind of apprenticeship model. And then you learn because there is no real knowledge. There is the set of public knowledge was very limited. Of course, there were Berkshire Hathaway letters. There's Buffett partnership letters. There are a few amazing books, many of them on your bookshelf. But overall, they teach you some things, but it's so difficult to learn a craft, practice, and get the feedback loop. It's so difficult. Fast forward to today. There are so many outstanding resources on whether it's YouTube, whether it's your podcast, whether it's you know, Apple Podcasts, whatever. Uh, there are many, many managers make their investor letters public. You can learn from those. You can see the idea process. You can see idea generation. You can see analysis. You can see what happened later with that idea and whether the thesis was right or wrong because it's very important to build that feedback loop it's not enough to read someone's letter or hear someone's podcast where they pitch talk X, Y, Z and say, oh my God, this is a great thesis and forget about it. No, you need to see whether it worked out or not and see whether it worked out for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons. That's how you establish that pattern recognition. So that's my, my advice here would be to immerse yourself into as many sources of knowledge among those I am, that I've listed and those are very readily available as you can. That's number one. And number two would be this. I believe that sometimes you would learn more from less known manager than mobile known manager. So my recommendation, my suggestion here is that when you learn something and you read someone's thoughts about XYZ topic, try to link it and sometimes it's not public information, so I appreciate that it may be challenging. But try to link that to their performance and their outcomes. In other words, if someone is saying you do X, Y, Z, and it makes sense to you, and you think that's right, but you look at their track record and it's not outstanding, it could mean one of two things. Either their thought process and thinking and suggestions are correct, but they're not very good at executing. Or you look at them and say, okay, maybe I think that their approach is correct, but it actually doesn't work. It's like the same if someone, if you go to the gym and you ask, okay, what do I do in order to get fit or in order to get strong or run really fast? 
you don't just get advice and suggestions from someone who tells you very convincingly, that's how you train and then you'll be running really, really fast. You actually go to someone who run either sprint very fast or someone, if it's endurance, you go to someone and say, listen, you've done a marathon three times over the last two years. How do you train for that? Tell me. And maybe they also did it with very good time result. You learn from them. So try to filter that because I often learn more from my peers that the big world never heard of. Then I would learn from someone who is very well known and they say things that appear to be very good. But uh, when I look at their track record, I'm like, do I really want to learn from this guy? Because it's not what I kind of, you try to model, you, you model after those who you want to become. That's the idea. So my point again here is that filter who you want to model after and don't be shy if that person would be that, you know, five people on the, on the planet heard of if they have smart things to say, and if they have the outcomes that you want to achieve as well. That's a great place to end it. Artem, where can our audience go and find more information on you, follow you, hear your insights, get in touch with you, you know, uh, give, give the people where they can uh, contact you. I think the easiest way is LinkedIn. Okay. Am I, uh, I think I will be in the rare minority of your guest, Bobby, who is not active on Twitter. So LinkedIn is probably the best. Just put Artem Fokin and you will find me. On it. At some point, you're going to get on Twitter, right? I, I have a Twitter account. I just don't really use it or I don't tweet. Okay. It's a shadow account. A shadow. Yeah. I don't even remember the handle. You're an, egg, you're an egghead on there. You know, I, I got you. <laughs> well, Artem, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a ton of fun. I learned a lot. I hope everybody out there really uh, learned a couple. I mean, there's so much great stuff here. So thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, if I don't see you before then, happy holidays, happy new year, the whole bit, man. And uh, happy holidays to you too. Happy holidays to Planet Microcap. And happy holidays to everybody who is listening. Hey, man, I'm going to see you in Vegas soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. See ya. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.